faithful God. And the scriptures even tell us that he is the giver of good gifts, which is true of him. And we do benefit so greatly from knowing the Lord, from being in his presence. 
But sometimes we just need to be reminded of just how great he is. And we declare songs that, that say, great are you, Lord, or that praise the Lord, or that just bless the Lord. And it's not so much that, that he needs to be reminded. It's that you and I need to be reminded. And, and yes, he pours out good gifts. Yes, he does good things for us. But more than that, he is good. He is good. And so this morning, we're just going to set our gaze upon him this morning as we continue to declare just how good he is.
morning sun was dead The savior of the world was falling His body on the cross His blood poured out for us The weight of every curse He is alive today. 
That is our hope. That is our strength today. I want to thank you for just coming into the house of the Lord today to open your heart in worship, to be responsive to the Lord, to let his grace and power flow into your life in a fresh way today. You know, there's so many things that happen all week long that can just drain our strength. Is there anybody here today that can just, you know, be a, a drag upon our heart? But it's a beautiful thing to gather as the family of God, to lift our voices in praise and worship, to allow the Lord's presence to come fresh to us today. Hopefully you received one of our little communion packets when you came through the door. If you didn't, but you would like to, we're gonna go to the Lord's table here in just a moment. And if you would like to partake of communion, we only have one prerequisite that we identify in scripture. And that is that you have opened your heart to a relationship with Christ. And if you're a seeker, but you've not come to that place of faith just yet, then I would just encourage you to pause on the communion, but you're in the right place. And even today could be your day to step into that place of a new relationship with God. But if you'd like to be served communion, please just lift a hand. Our ushers are gonna come right now and serve you today. Communion is, is one of the most profound things that we could be a part of. It's symbolic, but it's so powerful. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, just hours before he went to the cross, he was in the upper room with his disciples. And he took bread and he took a cup and he spoke to them a living message and it was handed down even to us. In fact, I'm gonna to read to you a scripture out of 1 Corinthians 11. And this is interesting because this was a revelation that Christ gave the Apostle Paul because the Apostle Paul wasn't there in the upper room. He was not one of the first disciples. He came in in his own words, like one abnormally born. He, wasn't, he didn't see himself as someone who would have been a follower of Christ. Some of you may say to yourself, I don't know if I'm one that would be a follower of Christ, but God has a plan and a heart that none of us would miss the goodness of God. And so the Lord spoke what I'm gonna to read to you to the Apostle Paul. And so here's what he says, for I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, anyone who um, eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. And here's a great uh, a message right for our hearts. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. And that is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. For when we're judged by the Lord, we're being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. You know, I've lived a little bit of life, but there's some things that just leave an imprint upon your life. And I'll just tell you, in my life, it was taking communion next to my parents because my dad took communion very, very seriously. And I would just watch him as he would take even a little wafer and he let that in his hand and the, and the cup in his hand. And you'd see him close his eyes and as a little boy, I would just watch him and you could just tell there was a process going on. There was a process of God, I'm, I'm prepping my heart to partake of what you've done for me. Today, can you join me in that very same th moment? Can we just hold these emblems in our heart, in our, I should say in our hands and open our hearts and let God speak to us today to wash us, to cleanse us, to remind us that we've been bought with a price. That's what this bread represents. And then the cup represents forgiveness, washing, confidence, that you know it's done in your life because Christ has already paid this price. Will you join me? Lord, we just open our hearts to you right now. We just wait upon you in our own way, in our own personal relationship with you. God, we wash, we ask for you to wash us, cleanse us, Lord, of the things that have gotten in the way between us and you. Lord, things that have hindered us, attitudes or thoughts or actions. But God, we come to your table today to be renewed, to be cleansed, 
to be set free in a fresh way. And I pray, Lord, for those who have been struggling with reoccurring issues and fears and doubts and anxieties, God. Areas, Lord God, of, of uh, sin that seems to be a trap. I pray, Lord, that today would be a day of people just stepping forth, knowing, wait a minute, if God be for me, who can be against me? You're my strength, dear God. You're my refuge. You're my hope. You're my rock. You're my fortress. So, God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for all that you're doing in this house, all that you're doing in the hearts of our people worshiping online. Lord, touch and bless them, I pray, in Jesus' name. Would you partake with me today? Let's take the bread. Thank you, Lord. As we get raised to just partake of this symbol of this cup, let this remind you, if you've asked Christ into your heart, you've asked him to cleanse you, you are clean right here, right now. Not three months from now, six months, right here, right now. So receive it, walk in it, and let his confidence fill your heart. Lord, we thank you, God. In Jesus' name, let's partake. Glory to God. Pastor Dalton, let's lift that up one more time. Let's sing it through just one more time about the victory of Christ. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Wow, it's just a beautiful day. I love being in the sunshine today. Didn't you love just driving to church with some blue skies? But I'll tell you what, God wants to do more than just give us a, a visual. He wants to give us a spiritual breakthrough today. So I'm really glad you're here today. Welcome to the house of the Lord. If you're brand new to us today at Easter Ridge, we want to just say thank you for coming. You may not realize this, but you're an answer to prayer to be here. We believe that God is doing a work here in the Northwest. We know that it's a, a, a place that's not known for its spirituality, but we're here to change that by the grace and the glory of God. So welcome to this family. You're needed here, you're wanted here, and we'd love to get to know you. So why don't you guys take about 60 seconds, greet some of the most fabulous people in the Northwest. They're just an arm's length away from you today. Grab somebody's name. Welcome to the family today. Welcome to Eastridge. I'm Pastor Josh. This I'm Dan. Is, and we're out here in the lobby right now live because we got some great things going on. It's We're getting ready to turn the page into the month of December, which means all of our Christmas festivities are coming up. And we've got a lot going on, a whole month that you don't want to miss out on. We're bringing back the star lighting. December 3rd, the star lighting is back. It's going to be an amazing night, fun festivities. We're going to light this building up. It's going to be incredible. That's right. Second weekend, uh, December, that Sunday night, we have a special Christmas concert. This 
This is unbelievable. We have Jordan Smith. He's the winner of The Voice. Going to be here for a free concert, a Christmas concert. Great to come to. Bring your family and invite your neighbors to. It's going to be an awesome event. Yeah, that's right. And then the third weekend in December is our Christmas celebration. We have our kids singing in the service. We're going to be telling the Christmas story. It's going to be one of those can't miss moments of the holiday season. Yeah, absolutely. And then Christmas Eve services. We have them all day starting at 2.30 all the way to 11 p.m. Woo, Christmas Eve service. And then Christmas Day is a Sunday morning. Right. We're having a single family gathering 11 a.m. on Christmas morning. So mark your calendars now. It's going to be a great weekend. That's right. Now, I don't know if you caught this, but there are so many great opportunities to invite a friend, a coworker, a neighbor to come join you here at Eastridge during the holiday season. And listen, we get it. Inviting a friend and a neighbor can be tough. It can be scary and intimidating. We don't get a lot of practice no. in life. So today we've set up a special station right here in the lobby, the Neighbor Inviter 3000. Come on. And this is a state of the art artificial intelligence station for you to practice what it actually looks like for you to invite a friend to church. So check this out. We have these great invitational tools, a door hanger, we have touch cards. And so we want you to come out here in the lobby and practice. We want yeah. to show you what it might look like, okay? So take the door hanger, go ahead, take it on over to the door, plop it on, but we don't just want you to leave it. We no. want you to knock on the door, talk to your neighbor. Dan, yeah. show us what and, this might look you like. You can try this yourself uh, after church, but uh, we're going to demonstrate right now. Uh, hey, hey, neighbor, how you doing? Hi, ho, neighbor. What can I do you for? Hey, uh, it's good to see you. Hey, you know, um, I go to Eastridge Church and we're doing a lot of cool stuff for Christmas. I wondered if uh, you might like to come join me. Uh, po possibly. What you got in mind? Oh, well, you know, uh, the first thing is we have a star lighting. Uh, it's uh, Saturday, December 3rd, 5 o'clock. We have Santa photos for the kids or, or, or for you too. I mean, you know, you anybody. Uh, we have caroling and, and, and cocoa, cookies. It's going to be really cool. Do you, you want to come? Well, I do fancy myself a good cookie, but you know how busy the weekends can be in December. That's true, that's true. Yeah. Tell them about Jordan Smith. Tell oh, them about yeah. Jordan oh, Smith. Oh, uh, well, uh, on December 11th, uh, 6 o'clock, we have a free concert. Uh, I don't know if you watched The Voice, but but this guy won The Voice. His name's Jordan Smith. He's doing a Christmas concert. Uh, you want to come join me? Hey, that's so great. I love music. You know what they say, the best way to spread Christmas cheer is to sing loud for all to hear. I, I couldn't agree more. That's right. So, yep. uh, you, you want to come? Hey, he's going to come. Yeah, we let's go. It. Let's go. Come Thanks, on. Thanks, neighbor. I'll see you there. So, uh, you can try the Neighbor Inviter Simulator 3000. Yep. Come out today. It's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. Hey, while you're out here in the lobby, we also invite you to swing by our Pastors Connect after service. Every single week, we want to make sure you have a chance to make a meaningful connection here at Eastridge Church. And our pastors and team are going to be out here. We'd love to greet you, meet you. Maybe and answer any questions you might have about Easter Church and just let you know that you're welcome and needed here. That's right. We invite you right now to take a minute to check in with us. Check in. It's easy, it's quick, and it helps us uh, connect with you. It helps you connect with us. If you want to submit a prayer, an expression of thanks, more information about something you hear, uh, you can do that through check-in. Just scan that QR code that you see on the screen or the one nearby, or just go to eastridgetoday.com slash check-in. just takes a few seconds. Yeah, and as you are getting ready for Thanksgiving this week, we do want to remind you we have a Thanksgiving Eve service this Wednesday night. It's one of the highlights of the year as we gather together as a church family and celebrate all the things that God has done in our life and in our church this last year. So make sure you join us this Wednesday as we celebrate Thanksgiving. And yesterday was one of the marker events in our calendar every year, our annual turkey giveaway. It was a great day and we want you to take a look. for the church and giving out turkeys. We have probably about eight people, my son's friends who have nowhere to go. Their families are all scattered. They're all coming to my house. We've had a really rough year and almost had to leave the area, so we're glad to stay. It's just gonna be the two of us this year for Thanksgiving, so um, my first time cooking a turkey, but I'm excited. <laughs> It means a lot because, you know, we are a low-income family and we don't have a lot of support in the community and this is really good for us, you know, just to help defeat the community. Thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it because, you know, food is really expensive right now. I think a turkey is probably like $40 and that's something we can't afford right now. So we really appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. Um, it means a whole lot um, because without you guys, a lot of people wouldn't have what they have. And so we plan on um, 
cooking the dinner and then going to our neighborhood and, and helping so we all can eat together. Um, thank you very much for all that you guys are doing. It's such a blessing and a lot of us wouldn't have stuff if it wasn't for all the blessings and God, you know, putting it in you all's hearts to do it. One of my family members lost their job, so yeah, it means a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much for like being here and helping all of us that are in need. So. Welcome to Eastridge Church. Whether you're joining us in the room or online, we're... Well, welcome everybody. Great to see all of you. It's great to see our West Seattle family as well. Can we welcome our West Seattle church family? And what a, what a great day. What a great day it was yesterday at both campuses. And, uh, you know, this is a, a week in which uh, with Thanksgiving holiday, we're even going beyond in just reflecting on what we're grateful for and uh, even a month ago, I was uh, allowed a sabbatical time, Lizette and I were, and just did a little extra reflecting. And one of the things we kept coming back to that we're so thankful for is this church family. And your generosity is incredible. Yesterday, it was on display in so many ways. Uh, from those of you giving resources, uh, dollars, so that we could provide those turkeys and groceries, to your time, uh, to your energy, your talents. It was great to see the body of Christ at work. So we just thank you so much. And it just uh, reminds me that you are a generous church and, uh, and that your generosity is truly, truly making a difference. You know, uh, not only here locally, but uh, we've got a missions uh, trip coming up in, in February uh, to Nassau, Bahamas to help a little struggling church that has a huge community impact. Uh, but they're trying to finish a building project, and we've helped them four years ago. We're going to have a meeting afterwards after the second service today at 1245 to talk about that. But these are just examples of us reaching out. But you know, the day in, day out ministry of the church only happens when people catch a vision that God has blessed us so that we can be a blessing, amen? And so there's things that happen all the time, every day uh, from this house that is a blessing to our community. And you know, we're entering a season here where it's just a few weeks left in uh, 2022. And uh, I can tell you from, uh, uh, from an ad, uh, administrative executive position, seeing uh, year after year, these are very important weeks uh, every day counts, every person counts, every gift counts, because it really sets the pace to enable us to know what we can do even going into 2023. And so would you pray over these next several weeks? Say, God, not only do I want to be faithful in the tie that belongs to you, but is there something even more that you're asking me to do so that we can keep reaching out, keep extending out to reach more and more people? And I know God will bless you for it. He always blesses those who have a generous heart. So let's pray over our offering before Pastor Steve comes, and let's just believe for a great season as we just reach out to this community and around the world. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you for your, your graciousness to us. We thank you, Lord, that you, you uh, bless us over and above what we even need. And you do that, Lord, so that we can be a blessing to others. And so, Lord, we pray that you would just help us as a church, even in these next several weeks, as we reach out in so many different ways. We pray that the light of, of you and your life would just shine brightly through us and that people would come to faith in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome our lead pastor, Pastor Thanks, Steve. Pastor Larry. Appreciate you. Thank you. Well, it is so good to see all of you. And I want to thank, think about this, 223 people that came out and served yesterday. And again, a big shout out to West Seattle. They did such a fantastic, I should say, you did such a fantastic job in West Seattle yesterday. It's always so great 
to see people come and, and to just many times have tears in their eyes of just gratitude and thankfulness, knowing it's, it's way more. How many know this? It's way more than a bag of groceries and a turkey could ever deliver. It's the heart, it's the spirit behind it that makes such a difference. And so I want to thank all of you for, for being a part of that. And I know you can kind of been nestled in there for a moment, but uh, how about if you stand with me? And let's just open wide our heart to what God has for us today. I just sense a very special anointing, very special touch of God right here in our house today. Even as we began to take communion, there was just a a beautiful sense of the presence of the Lord coming. And I just believe that we need to be ready and open and even seeking for what the Lord wants to do in the next few moments. Lord, I just pray over your people. Pray for here, West Seattle, those worshiping online in so many places. Lord, I pray that today you would use the preaching of your word to bring a miracle into each and every life. God, you know who we are. You know where we're at. You know the things that we need to hear in our own individual lives for such a day and such a time as this. Lord, I pray for people who carried some big burdens, some big questions with them when they came through the doors. And I'm asking you, Lord, today to come alongside, to minister to people as only you can. Lord, bring a living word to us, I pray. Let us be people who will not only hear the word of the Lord, but God, may we be responsive to you today and may incredible fruit come in the body of Christ because we've gathered here today to look to you. So we ask for it, Lord God, that you would speak. Let us hear, let us respond, and let us grow today in Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Turn to somebody next to you, just give them a little fist bump, let them know. Get ready, because God has a word for you today. There's something for you right here today, and it's going to be so good. I'm excited to be able to be with you today and be able to preach the word. We've been in a series the last number of weeks called Joy for the Journey. Many of you have approached and talked to us about how, boy, it couldn't have come at a more opportune moment in your lives to just have a fresh infusion, to be pointed in the direction of where hope comes from and where even more than hope, even joy comes into your life to live day to day, joy for the journey. So I'm glad you're here today. That's the good news. The bad news is we're finishing the book of Philippians. I mean, the book of Philippians is so rich, it's like we could have used a few more chapters. But uh, really powerful teachings coming from the heart of God lived out through the Apostle Paul. Isn't that how God always works? He lives his truth through his people. And so today, get ready, because I believe God's going to do things that are going to stir us, that are going to empower us, that are going to lead us closer to him. In fact, today, if you, if you want uh, a title or a, a theme to just grab a hold of for the day, it, it's just simply this, Christ is everything you need. How about that? He's everything you need. He's not kind of what you need or part of what you need. When you really get into the scripture and you really find who Christ is, he's everything. He's everything that we have need of. And so today, I want you to sense that sufficiency of Christ, not only as an exterior truth, but as a reality inside of your personal life. So if you have your Bibles, you have your devices, love to have you join me as we finish up this book. We're going to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to put it on the screens for you as well. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to take on verses 10 through 23. And here's what the scripture says, the apostle Paul's voice. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. So let's, re- let's review after one verse, okay? In this, what we would call the book of Philippians, was really a letter, the letter to the church in Philippi, modern-day Greece. Paul, if you're new to this story, joining us today, Paul was under house arrest in Rome, did not know whether he was going to live or die. He did not know what was going to happen. But this church in in what the town called Philippi was a Roman colony, even though it was in Greece, had a lot of retired Roman soldiers there. The emperor of Rome loved that because it really kept his influence in front of the people. And it it was that kind of a setting. Yet at the same time, it was a place of a mixture of false religion, immorality. It would fit in pretty well in 2022 right here where we live. We probably wouldn't notice too much difference if we were to walk into that setting and some of the things that people were doing in their lives, even in the name of spirituality. It's crazy days, crazy times. We're not the only people 
to encounter crazy days and crazy times. I don't know if that's encouraging or what, but it's a reality. It's true. And in the midst of that, the Apostle Paul is under house arrest, and there's this church in Philippi which he was there to found. And we've already gone through this, so I don't want to take too much time right here. But that church became very bonded to his heart. And we're going to read in just a moment about how in needs of his life, they were the only ones who were consistently there for him. They were the only ones who sacrificed or cared for his well-being. How many know sometimes out of sight, out of mind? And yet the church in Philippi held in high regard the servant of the Lord, and they took it upon themselves to be an encouragement and a place of strength. I think that is a word for us in the day and the hour in which we live. What kind of people are we going to be? What will we be known for? What will be our legacy? What will be our impact? What will God reward us for or be the most pleased with in our lives? I think it's when we stand up on behalf of his church and we live in a spirit of grace and we have a heart that no one be left behind. Let's take a look at the rest of this scripture. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you've renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you've had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, but I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And now he leads us to one of the most famous scriptures in the entire New Testament. And he says this, I can do anything through him who gives me strength. That's the NIV. Other text says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You know, some of you, you wear that t-shirt when you go to the gym. You're pumping iron with all, you know, through Christ, I can do all things. Some of you have it on a plaque in your on your wall somewhere, your office or in your house. I don't know, maybe the ultimate expression of this was what I saw at when we were on vacation one time, there was a guy that went by with his swimsuit on and the whole, his whole back across his shoulders and down said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And I was like, you know, when you tattoo your whole back with I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, you better live up to that billing. Isn't that true? <laughs> That's a public billboard. And, uh, but, you know, this is one of the most famous passages of Scripture, isn't it? People take a hold of this. It's a motivational moment. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But one of the keys to biblical interpretation, scholars out here, is to read the Scripture in its context to who it's written to. What is the circumstance? What is the situation? What is the context of the Scripture itself? What comes before it? What comes after it? And when you look at this, we can't pull out just one Scripture and say to ourselves, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength without realizing that the Apostle Paul is saying to the church in Philippi, you know, it was so good to see you and your concern for me. And he was saying, well, wait a minute, I have to back up. Remember, this is the most personal letter that he wrote to any church. He said, I'm, I'm so glad you renewed your concern for me. And then he says, well, wait a minute, no, I know you had concern for me, but you just didn't have a way to get that. I mean, no texting, no, no communication. But what happened was it was when, remember us studying Aphrodite? who was one of the leaders in Philippi, journeyed all the way from Philippi to Rome to bring Paul supplies. And not just to deliver food or to uh, a little bit of finance to help him through the next number of months. No, Aphrodite came to stand alongside of him. Aphrodite came to pray for him. Aphrodite came to speak hope. How many know, even if you're an apostle, you need hope like any other human being. You need fellowship. You need people in your life. You need to know somebody cares that you're not all by yourself. Anybody with me today? How about West Seattle? You know what we're talking about. That's why it's so important for us to be here together today. You're facing big trials and, and situations and choices and opportunities in your life. And we need the Word of God bringing truth into our lives. But we also need other people who will sharpen us, who will challenge us. As the Bible says, one man will sharpen another like iron sharpens iron. We need each other. We need godly influence in our lives or we won't be able to sustain or build the greatest things that God has designed our lives to be about. Anybody here today? Is there an amen in the house of God? So Paul is saying to the people, you know, 
you brought an expression that came through Aphroditus, and I want to thank you for that, and I want to encourage you in that. And then he's very, very um, aware of saying to the people, I'm not speaking to you because I have a need. In fact, I, I am well supplied. He's saying to them, I appreciate what you're doing. Don't take me wrong. I am thankful. I am thankful. He's already written to us in this scripture over and over his gratitude, his love for them, and, and how much it means to him to have their support. And even Timothy coming and saying, I don't have anybody in my life like him who really cares about the people of God. And he's, I mean, he's, he is there pouring his heart out. But now he says something that is so often overlooked and yet is so important to really get the message. The Apostle Paul says, I'm well taken care of right now. But you know something? I have learned, if you're taking notes today, here's number one, first point, is that Paul unfolds what he calls a secret. How many like secrets? Inside information. You want some inside information? I'm going to give you some inside information on how to be healthy in your mind, in your emotions, in your physical body, in your relationships. I'm going to give you a secret that most people are not even aware of. You know what it is? The Apostle Paul, we just read it. He said, I have learned the secret of being content in all things. Wow, that wasn't maybe the fireworks you were expecting. What's the big secret? What is it? It's going to make me healthy, body mind, emotions, relationships. What's the secret? It's being content. Now, that's interesting because I've done a lot of reading on this topic of contentment. And it's interesting between biblical scholars, pastors, leaders, man, there is all over the board. I mean, it seems pretty simple, doesn't it? What is it to be content? And yet there is so much question about what does that mean? What does it mean to be content? Because a lot of people say, you know, I'm content when I have everything I want, I'm good. Other people say, I'm good when I have everything, not just that I need, but I'm good if I just have everything I want. If I have everything I want, I'm content, I'm okay, I'm good. Other people, they think, wow, if I'm content, that means that I'm just settling. I'm just settling in. I'm just content to be where I'm at, doing what I'm doing, and I'm not going to strive, or I'm not going to have big dreams or big goals. Listen, that's not at all what this is talking about. This is talking about how does a human being live in relationship with God and trust in God for your well-being, trust in God for your spiritual health, the, the balance in your own life. Boy, you're really quiet today. Maybe it was the big secret. How do you stay emotionally healthy when other people around you are struggling? How do you step out of discouragement, despair, disappointment, sometimes even broken dreams or broken relationships? How can you be healthy in body, mind, and spirit? Paul says the secret is to be content. So when you really stop and analyze what does content mean, I think out of all of the fog and all of the opinions and everything, I think that the best... That the best uh, definition that I take personally and that I would offer to you is that contentment is this place of confidence in the goodness and the love of God for you. It's that place where you realize, my God is for me, and if God is for me, who can be against me? My God sees me. My God knows me. My God is paying attention. His eye is upon me. His ear is attentive to my cry. He cares about me. He has more invested in me than anybody else has invested in me. Christ came out of glory and bore my sin and my sorrow, even my judgment, that I could be set free to get up and live the greatest life that I could ever live. Why should I doubt this God who loves me so greatly? So what does he say? It's out of this place of contentment. What does that mean? Confidence in the goodness of God. Confidence in the attentiveness of God. Confident in the, of, of, of God's not only awareness, but his commitment to you. And out of that, you know what Paul is saying? I know what it's like to abound. I know what it's like to have plenty. I know what it's like to even have things, you know, just put into my, my life in an amazing way. 
But I also know what it's like to be a base. What does that mean? I know what it's like to be leveled. Think about the stories of Paul, shipwrecked, broken, bobbing in the ocean, other times where he'd been whipped and, and where he was stoned and left for dead. I think he knows what he's talking about when he says, I know what it's like to be a base. I know what it's like to be leveled. I know what it's like to have nothing. I know what it's like to be hungry. Anybody in this room know what it's like to be hungry besides a little bit of afternoon growling in your tummy? The, the key, the secret is put your faith in God. He is everything you have need of. It, you know, following Christ doesn't mean you're always going to have it easy. It doesn't mean that it's always going to go the way you want it to go or I want it to go when we want it to go that way. But it means this. You can do anything through Christ who gives you strength. Whether you wear the T-shirt or the tat, whatever, you can live this. I can do all things. What? I can press through when the world levels me because of the God that I know. He is with me. And even when I abound, I can be faithful to God. You know what a spiritual reality is? In the human experience, most of us do better spiritually when we're actually in a place of need than a place of plenty. It's true. When we have a sense and a personal awareness of our need of God, we have a tendency to lean in. Isn't that right? When do you fast the most? When do you pray the most? When do you get on your knees the most? It's usually when something's up. Otherwise, we have a real struggle, don't we? Our, our human reality is that we struggle with wealth and we struggle with the applause of people more than we struggle with anything else as far as potentially shipwrecking our own lives with pleasure and excess. I mean, how many people do you see every single day in our culture, whether they're movie stars, whether they're athletes, whether they're musicians, you name it, business people, wherever they are, who have climbed to the pinnacle of their occupation or their field, and then you watch them fall off the other end because they don't have the moral character or the, the wisdom to be able to sustain the blessing that was put into their hands. You know what the Apostle Paul says? I have learned the secret. I've learned the secret. You know what it is? It's contentment. Because if I can be faithful and confident in God's goodness, then I can be his servant no matter where I am and no matter what's happening in my life. You know what Pastor Jenkins would say right now? Preach on, Pastor. Yeah. These are truths, aren't they? You know, one of the, it's great to know some of the great famous scriptures. It's just better to know what they really mean. I can do all things, no matter what's required of me, by Christ who gives me strength. I'm not diminishing that truth. I'm lifting that truth. But I'm just telling you, it's deeper than you thought it was. It's more powerful than you thought it was. So hang on to it. When your back's against the wall, when people talk down to you, when the, the bottom seems to fall out from underneath you, I want you to know something. Nothing's changed. You're still in the palm of God's hand. And with Christ, all things are possible, and you can do great things because of the strength that he's going to put in your soul. we got another world-famous scripture to get to, so we better roll on, okay? Let's go to the next, the next uh, paragraph. Look at verse 14, Apostle Paul. Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Isn't that an amazing passage of Scripture? The Apostle Paul is saying, thank you for coming. Thank you for sending Aphrodite. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for praying for me. Thank you for supplying. But I just want you to know in the midst of this scenario, it was good for you to share in my troubles. In other words, what he was saying is, it's good that you don't live an arm's length away from where I'm at. Have you ever been hurting in your life? When you're hurting in your life, you don't need somebody to live at an arm's length from you. You need somebody to come close to you. Many of you have been asking me about the meeting that I was invited to go to this last week about race relationships. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that because so many of you have been asking me about that. But I'll just interject a moment right here where Pastor Rick Warren in that meeting, 
He spoke about loss and pain and being with people who are in pain and people who have suffered loss and caring about them. And Rick Warren has the personal experience to speak the truth to the situation because Rick Warren had an adult son who struggled with mental illness and ultimately ended up committing suicide. And just the devastation that Pastor Rick and his wife Kay went through with the loss of their son, as deep as it gets. And when he was talking about pain and division and hurt that people are living through, he said these words. He said, I can just tell you this, that the deeper the loss, use less words. Because there's none of your words that can take away that pain or that loss. He said, so just think about this. The deeper the pain, use fewer words. And then he said something that we have taught here for over 20 years. He said, just come closer to the pain and minister through the presence, the ministry of presence, where people just know that you are there and that you care about the pain that they are in. There is nothing more important to a hurting human being than knowing that there's somebody else that cares about the pain that they're in. They don't expect us to cure it. They don't expect us to take it away. But they receive so much by knowing somebody hears. And Isn't this what the Apostle Paul says? Can I read it to you again? He said this, Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. We kind of want people to share in our success, don't we? We want people to share in the celebrations. I think it's a great lesson for us right here in the day and the hour in which we're living to allow the Holy Spirit, to allow God to teach us to be stronger Christians and a stronger representation of God by being willing to roll up our sleeves and get involved in things that are painful and things that are messy and come alongside of people and offer them hope as Christ would minister it through us. Let's keep going. He says this, Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Listen to this. Not that I'm looking for a gift but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied. Can you see him saying that? He's under house arrest. He's got a, he's got a, a, a soldier with him 24-7. He's got some chains. He's under house arrest. And he says, you know what? I got what I need for right now. I'm amply supplied because you sent Aphrodite and you took care of some big needs in my life. So I'm not looking for another gift. I'm thanking you for what you've already given. But at the same time, I don't want you to let your foot off of the gas of what God is doing in your heart. Because it was good that you stepped into my pain. It was good that you stepped into my sorrow. You stepped into my trouble. It was good that you cared. It was good that you sacrificed. It was good that you sent one of your best to stand with me and to pray with me. It was good that you were risk takers. That you would send Aphrodite to Rome not knowing if he too would be imprisoned. If he might lose his life as many others were under the, under the tyrant of the day. Listen church, we can't play on the, in the safe side of the pool. We can't stay on the shallow side when our world is dealing with such deep and dark issues. We need to be the light. We need to be the salt. We need to be the people that care. We need to know what it is to get messy. We need to know what it is to step into somebody else's trouble that they might know the glory of God. If we're not willing to step up to the battle, we can't expect to win. Church has never lost a battle that we've shown up for. But we have forfeited a lot. This is no day to forfeit. Anybody here? This is a day to let God anoint you. Let God give you wisdom. Let God give you words. Let God stir you. Let your light shine. Let your fruit be tasted. Because that's how good our God is. He's a God of answers. It's God of miracles. I love this scripture because this is who we are as a church. 
We have believed this. We have put it into action. We have lived this. Don't just read the Scripture. We, we say, God, teach us your ways. If you came into our staff meetings every week, this is where we live. Come into our board meetings. This is where our leadership stirs. We are praying to be a soul-winning people. We are praying to stand. We know that, that we're in a difficult place. There's no doubt about it. But we're praying for the light to shine even brighter, for breakthroughs to come, and that we could be an instrument of God's hand for such a day and such a time as this. No giving up, no quitting, no packing it in. None of the attitude that says, hey, you know what? We know the Lord. That's good enough. What, what more could we want but for us and our family to know God? No, that's not enough. That's not a kingdom mindset. You know what the Apostle Paul says here? He says, thank you. You've done amazing. Let me tell you how amazing you are. You would think that some of the other churches that have been planted would have got the same spiritual truths and put them into action. But it's disappointing sometimes. Because the Apostle Paul says, you know what? Not one other church but you. Sometimes when, when you know that you're the only ones carrying the freight, there's almost a temptation to say, well, why should we then if nobody else is? And the Apostle Paul says, no, it's not, that's not the way this is. You are to be commended because when no one else cared, when no one else would take the action, when no one else would sacrifice, you did it over and over and over again. And then he says this, I'm not asking for another gift. This is really super important. Are you ready? Nudge the person next to you. You don't want to miss this. This is like secret number two. Because what he says here is this. I'm not looking for a gift, but I'm looking what can be credited to you. Did you just let that scripture just go right by you, or did you let the Holy Spirit stop you? Because this is a kingdom principle that's so deep right here. What the Apostle Paul is saying, you're doing what other people weren't daring to do. But don't take your foot off the gas. Don't think that you've done everything you're to do. No, you are to continue. You know what he will write to the, we read this from time to time out of 1 Corinthians. You know what he'll say to the church in Corinth? He will say, while you're excelling in all these other things, see to it that you excel in this grace of giving. So what he's saying here to the church at Philippi is he's saying, you've done so well. Don't let up. Because God is giving you an anointing that no one else has gotten hold of. Don't let up on this anointing. Be that kind of people. You know what I'm doing? I'm looking for your continued growth. I'm looking for what can be accredited to you in heaven. i got to ask you, what's the scoreboard in heaven right now with where you are? And the things that you're sowing. Sorry, got a little, little um, I don't know what it is, but there's something floating around in my throat right now. The other day I was preaching. Well, no, I won't even go into it. Well, I better now because you're wondering. I had like a bug fly in my mouth while I was preaching. And, and I was having to try to, you know, take care of that. Well, you know, not even. You should try this gig. It's not what you think. But anyhow, where in the world are we? Okay. All right. I, I know where we are. He's saying to them, I'm looking for what can be accredited to you. I mean, business people, you know about credits and debits. And he's saying, I'm looking for what can go into your account, not just in Philippi, but in front of our God. So he's saying to them, keep, keep going. What you have learned, keep growing. What you are discovering, press in. Be that people. You know, this church right here, we, we took this upon ourselves years and years ago to say, Let's see what we can do to reach as many people as we can in our community. And, and let's lean in. Thank you for a turkey giveaway. Thank you that we're going to give away 900 toys. These are just surface things. You know, what happens, the deep things of this church, thank you for supporting this church with your prayers and your giving. Because every single day, basically even 24 hours a day, there's ministry that's going out from this church into this community. Yeah, it's rocky soil. But by the grace of God, we're going to be used by God to touch people's lives. But not only that, but we have taken a call, and that is to help other people in the ministries where they are and to be able to help fuel what they're doing and help people who do something incredibly better than we ever could to just get, you know, 
the resource and the prayers and, and the help to them to help them do even more. And this church has grown. We have grown into a leadership ministry making a difference. And I would just say this to you. I hope you can receive it in the spirit of like an Apostle Paul. Keep going. Don't let your foot off the gas. Don't tell yourself, oh, we've come far enough or we've done enough or, hey, we're, we're doing more than all these other churches. We're the number one mission church in our, in our area. And we have been year after year after year. So did we just go, oh, we're so good. Hoist a banner for Eastridge. No, it's not about that. It's about that person that doesn't know the Lord today. It's about that family that's hurting and broken. It's about that person that's drug addicted and doesn't feel like there's any way out. It's that person who's been walked out on. These are the people that God has called for us to come and be a part, stand with them in their days of trouble that we may help lead them to their days of victory. That's who we are. That's what we're about. And it comes right out of these scriptures. It's not enough for us to know all about the Bible we need to both know the Bible and we need to live the Bible. And we need to live it boldly. We need to live it strong. And we need to be people who will, will really allow God to stretch us. You know, sometimes people have a tendency to live within their comfort zone. Anybody here honest enough to say, you know, I have a tendency. I have a tendency to draw a line where I'm comfortable. But God wants us to step beyond where we're comfortable and to be people who can make a difference and do it in ways that maybe, maybe we're uncertain of. Examples is going across the street. I know we have Pastors Connect out there, but I know that none of you are going to go to Pastors Connect today because you're going to be over there with the guy going, hello, uh, uh, yeah, well, you know, do you want to come to Easter? You're going to be out there toying with whatever they called that, you know. <laughs> are these guys crazy that we have on our team or what? <laughs> It's a crazy crew, I'll tell you. But anyhow, you're going to, you know, there's so much that God wants to do in us. Think about just even this last week. Had the opportunity, the invitation to be brought into uh, an event, a meeting, a moment with leaders in the black community. And some people might say, well, what do we really have to do with that? Why should we care? What difference does it make? I would say this. That shouldn't really be a question in our mind, should it? Because we are kingdom people. And where, where our community is in need, we should be on the forefront, do whatever we can. And we should try and we should sow, we should believe, we should come and stand along where the herd is and see what we can do. And out of this setting, in fact, I believe this. I, I believe that in the realm of evangelism and speaking truth, right now, we, we have our, our, our culture is moving so fast, and there are thoughts and messages and things that are being taught that if we, the church, don't stand in the gap, we are going to miss such an important formative moment and we are needed right now more than you and I could even imagine. And, and without salt and light in the situation, we're going to see greater devastation instead of answers coming into our lives. Because the issues are big and we can't ignore. We cannot, if, we're, if, we have our, if, we have our, if we can't see what's going on right now, what would it take for you to figure out something big is happening right now in our lives and in our culture and the direction of our nation and our kids and everything else. What would it take if we can't see it right now? And so in this setting, it's not even just about African Americans, but this meeting centered on that. There was one representative who was there who's the head of the National Associ Association of Evangelicals, and he, he's an Asian, Korean brother. And then there was another one who's one of our Assembly of God pastors was there from, who's a Latino from Orlando, has a, a great church there in Orlando. And then it was Bishop T.D. Jakes. It was our friend John Jenkins, who has become one of the most amazing leaders. We already know that from this church as our friendship. But what you may not know is he's now not only pastoring a great church, but he is now the head of their denomination, over a thousand churches. He's the chairman of the board of the National Association of Evangelicals. I mean, Pastor John is in a place of tremendous influence across our country. 
Bishop Jakes brought in Ph.D. black scholars to talk about historical aspects, people who are experts in culture, the head of Barna Research Group, the owner of Barna Research. You think it's George Barna, but no, George sold that company. So the owner of Barna Research was with us. I asked if we could bring my sons, uh, my son Josh and my son-in-law. There was only about 10 white people invited from around the country to be in the room, Rick Warren being one of them. And they allowed me to bring my sons. So we were a heavy Jameson influence in the room. (laughs) And I'll just tell you that it's too big a story for me to tell you everything right now. In fact, in that room, what was going to be discussed was deep stuff. And because of that, um, everyone was told, no recording, no video, no photographs. This is just this meeting. Afterwards, Bishop and Pastor Jenkins clicked the photo with our family. (laughs) But that was afterwards. Because nothing was wanting to be taken out of context. You could just imagine something getting posted out of context where people are coming you, and, and trying to peel back, why is there pain? What are the issues? Where do we go? How do we find any answers? How do we go forward? And I'll tell you what, one day, a whole day is not even enough to really even unpack all of these issues. And, and I'll tell you, honestly, this, I, I told our Saturday night audience, our audience, our congregation, that... Um, I'll probably set up a night, if you'd like to come, maybe a Wednesday night or a Thursday night, where I can unpack big issues in a different setting, because it's just too hard to do on a Sunday morning. Can you, can you grab that with me? Because these are big, deep areas, and without some context and some understanding, we will not get it, because we, we're so different in our experiences, we just won't get it. And yet, you know from where you go to work, your companies and your schools and everything is going one direction. And so, Pastor Jenkins, he, he asked me, I mean, there was great guys on this panel. I mean, Bishop A.R. Bernard, uh, who has the largest church in New York, and, and Pastor Bernard worked with us with Jammin years ago. We did a Madison Square Garden event. And so, it was just, you know, seeing some of these people that we have had events with, Columbus, Ohio, you know, some of these different places. Those leaders are there in the room. And Pastor Jenkins said to me, you need to tell the, the people. I, I was just there to kind of see what was going to happen. And, uh, and honestly, it was amazing. But I, I told my sons before we went in the room, I said, you guys, you've got to guard your heart because it will be very easy for you to be offended by things that are going to be said. And if you allow a fence to come in, you're not going to be able to hear what's really behind. And you're not going to be a part of the solution. Rick Warren got up and he talked about how leaders have to be able to endure pain. You have to be able to absorb pain. We do it as pastors all the time. We take some of the load of people's pain every time they come and bring their needs to us. That's what leaders do. Leaders absorb pain and lift burdens. And Rick Warren got up in this meeting and he said, you know, we're talking about the things that are the deepest issues that are happening in our country right now, and we're going to have to carry the pain in order for there to be conversation and breakthrough. And then the pain came. Bishop Jakes talked about, people say, well, why do you guys even bring up slavery? Slavery is so long ago. And Bishop Jakes was like not much more than an arm's length away from me. And I could see him with his body begin to shake. And he was saying, don't tell me that slavery is so far away because I can still touch it. He said, when I was a 10-year-old boy, my grandmother would hold my hand. My grandmother would embrace and love and hug me. I ate the food of my grandmother. And my grandmother lived her life as a slave. So don't tell me that slavery is so far gone it doesn't touch our lives. He talked about a relative who was lost. 
that he saw as a boy wrapped in barbed wire and a bloody blanket. And he's like, don't tell me that these things don't touch our lives. And it was painful. Pastor Jenkins said to me, we had a lunch break, and Pastor Jenkins said to me, you need to, you need to tell this group about our relationship, and you need to tell them why you came. Why did I come? I came because I wanted them to know that there were people who looked like us who cared about where they're at in their lives and where their kids are at, their grandkids are, and that there's more of us who care than they think there, there are. And Pastor Jenkins said to me, you need to say it. You need to say it. I'm like, honestly, in those settings, you've got to be careful because you can say something that may not come out right, and it can cause a lot of pain all over again. So anyhow, Bishop Jake said, okay, we're at a time where we want to hear your, your comment. And Pastor Jenkins was sitting across the room from me. I came in and sat down with some people that were from places like Columbus and these different places, and, and Pastor Jenkins sitting across the room from me. And when, when Bishop says, we want to hear, we want to hear you know, your comment, and John's over there going, and I'm going, and he's going. <laughs> so I stepped up. And the first thing I said was, I want to thank you for allowing us to come and be a part of this conversation with you. I said, you know, I have 25 years of or more of interacting and serving in the black community. And I said, there's a real initiation process to come into the community. But once you can get into the community, you find things in the community you can't find in another place. You can find redemption, forgiveness. You can find commitment that you can't find in a lot of other places. And I said, so it's my privilege to be able to be with you today. And I said, um, what I want to talk to you about is how do we go forward here? And I think the only way we can go forward is if we get committed to real, true relationship. Because without relationship, you can't talk about the things that are deep in your life. And I said, you know, Pastor Jenkins is asking me to speak to you right now. And so out of relationship, I'm speaking to you. And I said, I want you to realize that I invited Pastor John years ago to be a chairperson for an event we were doing in D.C. And it was something that he ordinarily wouldn't have even chose to be a part of, but the Lord prompted him to be a part, and he stepped into that leadership. And through that relationship, we became friends. And we decided, we saw, uh, you know, that God brought us together for a purpose. And it was more than an event. It was more than just the people that would come and get saved by what we were doing. There was something that was to happen in our lives, and we took it to heart. I said, you know, one of the days when, when we were preparing for this event in Washington, D.C., Pastor Jenkins invited our committee over to his house for dinner. And while we were sitting there, can you just imagine this setting that we're in right now when I'm telling this story? I said, we're sitting in Pastor Jenkins' house, and he told us, he said, you know, up until just a few years ago, this piece of land was deeded, legally deeded, that no Negro could own this piece of land. I said, the moment he said that, my wife and I, we just felt like there was an arrow shot through our hearts. Because that had, where we live, how we've grown up, those things are a long ways away from us. They weren't a long way from them. Pastor Jenkins, I said, he didn't say those words to hurt us. He was just telling part of the story. And he said, you know, so, so many days I'll go out in the backyard and I'll just roll in the grass and thank God for where we are today. And I said, but you know, in, that, in our lives, we've sacrificed for each other. We've sacrificed to have relationship. We have worked through things that we don't agree upon. We discuss things. But it's out of choosing to respect each other, choosing to love each other. I said, we're in each other's homes. We don't have a surface relationship. We're not, we're not the Starbucks. We go to the third place. No, we come to our homes. And we engage our children. I said, that's why it's a blessing to even be able to bring my son into this room today. 
We've engaged our families in the quest to find healing and a a better future. I said our churches have been committed to each other. Every time they have a, a building campaign, our church gives a gift to their church to help them. We sow a seed. And they turn around and sow more back into us. And we've done it again and again. It's like the Philippians. Paul says, you're the only church. You're the only ones that came to deal with my trouble and stand alongside of me in my trouble. When I had needs, nobody else gave, only you gave. And then the Apostle Paul lands this other incredible scripture. He says, and my God shall supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You know where that great promise of your needs being met? It's when you're willing to come alongside the trouble. You're willing to yield to the places where God prompts you to give. I didn't tell them in that. This is just preaching right here. But what I talked to them in that setting was about how even when my son Josh was getting married, Pastor Jenkins flew across the country, walked into the chapel, was there for the wedding, hugged their necks, loved on them, and then got into a rental car and went to the airport and flew home that night because of the demands on his schedule for the next day. And how, when his son Josh, how about that? When his son Josh was getting married, I flew across the country and walked into the room to be there for their family to celebrate their son. I said there was a a time when our church was facing a financial hurdle. We had to hit a certain uh, reserve that the bank never told us that we needed to have, and they sprung it on us. We had to, at the end of the year, hit a a, a reserve that we didn't even know about. And Pastor Jenkins called me and said, hey, are you guys, how you doing? You going to make it? And I said, it's close. I think we're going to make it, but it's close. We're praying. And he said, I'm going to send you $100,000. I said, no, I don't want you to. We're, we're going to make it. He said, I can't risk you not making it. I said, okay, why don't you put that check inside of an envelope, inside of another envelope, and if I need it, I'll pull that envelope out, and if I don't need it, we'll send the envelope back to you. He said, no, that's not the way this relationship works. This is a gift. And he gave $100,000 helped us cross the line. That's the story I told this group of people. And I said, you know, there's a great word when we talk about relationships. It's the word respect. And if there's not a respect, there can never be a good relationship between people. And I said, it's just like, I said, so many of you are pastors in this room. And you work with people with broken relationships and broken marriages. And we all understand something. And that is that if you bring together an, a man and a woman who are ready to walk away from each other, if they don't stop where they are and reevaluate, and if they don't make a decision, I want this relationship to work, and even say it to the other person, I care about you, I love you, I want this to work. If they can't get those words off of their lips, you've got nothing to work with and you've got nothing to live in that relationship. But the moment that they'll step forward out of their hurt, out of their disappointment, out of their pain, out of a sense of being so overwhelmed, they're going to give it all up. If they can just say, I want to see this work. I care. I love you. If they can get that out, then all things become possible. And that's exactly where we are with these issues that are so deep in our culture, so deep in our kids. Some of us at a certain age, we don't realize how deep these things are in Gen Z and the directions of where things are going. We need it. We need a breakthrough. And we need the church. We need Eastridge to be the Philippian church of the day. We're going to stand alongside of people doesn't matter what their topic is. We're going to do our best just alongside people and to get into alongside of their trouble that we might be a part of their victory. How many are with me on this today? 
wherever you are. <laughs> West Seattle's probably standing up and down. These are deep things. These are deep things. But the most important thing, when we stand before God one day, do you think He's, do you think he's going to be that interested about where we went for vacation, how many cars or boats, or how big our house was? Or do you think he's going to care about when we stepped in on behalf of the kingdom to touch people's lives and show them love and care and healing and be the, be the church? It was amazing moments. People came and hugged our neck said, thank you for being here. Thank you for caring. Thank you for partnering. It was worth it. It's not over. But the truth is, that was one of the most important conversations that has happened in I don't even know how long, particularly into the scholars and spiritual leaders in the African-American community. It was a watershed moment. And I told Bishop Jakes, I said, there's more people who look like us who care. Do you know what he said to me? I need you to help me meet them. What if you and I took the call to be the people of the Church of Philippi today? We're going to be risk takers. We're going we're to sow seeds. We're going to believe God, whether it's our time, our 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 compassion, our finance. We're just going to show up across the street, across the world. I feel like I'm all by myself here today. What about, what about you guys? Are you here? Are you here for this? All right. If you're here for it, I want you to, I want you to stand up. And I'd, I'd like for you to walk right down the front. And I'd like to pray over us that we can be the business leaders, the school teachers, the the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, the moms, the dads, that, that we could look for the answers. What if we, somebody's always got to sow the first seed, right? Let's be seed sowers. Let's sow seeds. Amen? Come on in. You got a lot of people behind you. Come on. Thank you. Let's believe for big things. Let's believe for big things. How great would it be to see a spiritual revival that starts out of compassion and love and the willingness to go the extra mile? It's great principles, right? Some of you may be struggling in a marriage. Your marriage could be healed if you take these principles home business situations messed up. Take these principles home. Speaking into culture, speak it out of these attitudes. Come alongside the pain. Deeper the pain, less words, closer, right? Let's believe it. Will you pray with me? Will you maybe just leave and lift your hearts? Would you, would you say something between you and God right now about what, would you say a response to the Lord? Because obviously he's touching our hearts. What are we gonna say to God? in response to what he's saying to us. Lord, we just come before you today and we thank you for our, our dear friends. We thank you for Pastor Jenkins and his leadership, God. We thank you, Lord, for Bishop. We thank you for people like Rick Warren and so many others. And, and God, we just pray. We, we don't know the answers, but we know you do. And we know, Lord God, that everything that we have need of is found in you. And Lord, I just pray for, for people in every tongue, every tribe, because that's your kingdom. I pray for people at this altar right now. So many different ethnicities, so many different experiences, and so many different life experiences. And God, I just pray that you will use us as one body. Come on, somebody. Lord, I pray that you would use us as one body, knit together with a common vision, a common heart, that, Lord, we would humble ourselves and we would, we would seek you. We would ask you for wisdom. We would ask you for courage. We would ask you for compassion. We would ask you for answers. 
And God, I pray you, you would add to us daily those who are being saved. I pray, God, that you would make us a people who truly love our neighbors as ourselves. That, God, we would give other people the benefit of the doubt. We would reach across. We would walk across the room. We'd walk across the street. God, that, that we would believe you. We would pray over these issues. And God, I'm gonna pray right now. I pray for our people in key positions. There are so many leaders in this room right now, business owners, leaders, God, I, influencers, teachers, God, all these people. Lord, I pray for you to use them. I pray, God, you'd give them discernment, give them wisdom, give us, Lord God, how we can make the difference, Help we, how we can step into the gap and be the ones that tip the scale for the sake of a kingdom outcome. And I pray, dear God, for those who have sown and those who have given, that we would not grow weary in what we've done, but God, that we would continue to grow and stand in these anointings that you have entrusted to us. And I'm praying over this church. I pray, God, you would give us what we have need of here and in West Seattle to be a church that thrives and, and impacts for the glory of your name. Lord, we pray for breakthroughs. We pray for miracles in the name of Jesus. And God, we pray over our nation. We pray even, Lord God, over these areas that are, that are painful today and things that we don't fully understand. God, answers that are yet to be seen. But God, we pray that we could be a church that leads the way with a deep and powerful love for each other. And I pray, God, you would help us. Watch over us, God. Let us grow in love and unity and vision even beyond where we've been right now. Take us to another level, we pray. And bless, Lord God, your work. And we just want to give you praise and honor. And God, I pray for people right again at this altar. Lord, marriages, families. I pray restoration. I pray healing in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, you'll give us words of how to, how to be healers, how to speak healing, how to speak wisdom, how to be able to bring light and salt in the midst of this day of conflict. Give us answers, we ask. We thank you, God. I thank you for this church. I love this church. I love your people. And I pray that you'll knit us closer together than ever before. And we just give you praise, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.